you know, it's right before the camera started rolling. Um, the Hacker Earth community in particular is very much, well, it's very large. It's 8 million developers globally dispersed, all different kind of skill sets and all different walks of life. So Web3 being that we have on a good day, 28,000 devs working in Web3 globally, right? There's less than one-tenth of 1% 1 or something like that the last time I checked. So it seems like there's probably a good people, good amount of people in the audience that are interested or skeptical or even curious about Web3, but might, know, might, might not know why to even consider Web3 as a tech stack or why to get involved and like have seen all the parties and have seen all the cool stuff, but... Are, are more interested in like, okay, what is this? Why, why should I care, right? So we'll dive into all of those different types of topics and kind of uh, double click on all this stuff. So appreciate you guys joining. And well, let's start with where we, we just kind of left off. Let's talk about blockchain in general. Um, what about blockchain in particular got you excited enough to leave a job at a bank? Right, Kevin, in your case, or Steph, leave a job at uh, an engineer at AWS or at Amazon, right? So we'd love to kind of hear a bit more about what excited you. I think part of it is, oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah. Part of it, I think, was seeing um, uh, seeing everything on, uh, on Twitter and in hackathons, seeing things uh, get built um, that were uh, extremely uh exciting and kind of uh viral i think is is maybe the word um you see kind of a potential you see that things are not fully formed as they are now uh but you could kind of see hey if this evolves if this gets 100% or 200% better then we're we're really on to something here um i'm also very interested in the empowerment you know of of individuals where individuals kind of own you know their uh financial sovereignty and uh having that coupled with, you know, unstoppable smart contracts, I think is a pretty powerful concept. Yeah, my, my answer is a little bit embarrassing. I got in because of NFTs. It was like 2020, 2021 during COVID. Um, all my friends were on Clubhouse in like those chat rooms, just talking to random people and NFTs would come up a lot as a potential way to like flip and make money. Um, I, I knew about stocks and I knew a little bit about crypto as in I was buying at that point, but I realized you can also develop NFT collections and things to make like side income. So it's embarrassing, but the, the magical monkey pictures on the internet is what hooked me initially. And then I got kind of farther and farther into seeing the different technology. I remember my friends at AWS were like, why do you want to develop in Web3? That's kind of embarrassing just because like it didn't seem scalable from the outside because just like by nature, having a ton of copies of things distributed makes them slower, makes for more places to like keep updated. So as a software developer, it, it's not intuitive initially as to why that's a good thing. But then if you think about like transparency and censorship resistance um, and all of that, things start to make sense. So I had this real degen to regen path where I started as a complete degen trading shit coins and looking at monkey pictures. And I ended up kind of like looking at blockchains as public goods and seeing really important use cases. And that's what's kept me um, in the space. Although I still own some like random NFTs, I, I don't look at them every day anymore. And I, at the beginning I did, and that's what I was like getting up to do in Web3. But now working in it, you kind of see more projects that are actually interesting and that have really cool engineering impacts. Um, and I no longer think of Web3. I, I don't know if anyone watched Succession, but there's this Logan Roy quote, and he's like, these are not serious people. And <laughs> that meme is kind of how I imagine that my old uh, Amazon friends used to see Web3, but now when I talk to them and I talk about cool upcoming projects, uh, for example, like Eigenlayer, um, that are kind of building infrastructure so that anyone can use validators, or just like things that are really interesting engineering-wise and also have real-world use cases to make like all of this stack more usable for everyone. Um, it just keeps me excited about the space. 
it, it's super cool. The deeper you get, the more you kind of get hooked, you know, which is which is rare, I would say for sure. Um, and going without saying, the last 10 years have been full of a lot of ups and downs, right? What do you think is in store, let's say both on an, an innovation side, which is inherently linked to everything else, um, in, in blockchain in general, from a builder's perspective? One thing that uh, that we're seeing right now, that's not 10 years, I mean, this is the, the current, but we're seeing, I think, AI help a lot of people. Right. Um, if you're a, a new builder and you just want to get started building some smart contracts, you can do that on your own and you can kind of get supercharged by doing this uh, with something like chat GPT. Um, so probably I, I would expect that to only you know grow in influence. Um, I'm also hopeful and, and cautiously optimistic that, um, you know, regulatory clarity will kind of help, um, you know, the U.S. Uh, advance. And give confidence, you know, to to builders who may be uncertain or um, maybe you know cautious about um, taking risk without uh, without regulatory clarity. Yeah, totally agree there. Like regulation being becoming more clear is super important and gives everybody a higher level of confidence in that. Like, oh yeah, we can build on this and we won't get sent to prison or something. Um, so that's really important. I also think it's just been interesting over the last few years to see more and more of the primitives be built. So I think Vitalik said um, last month that now that all those so many more primitives are there than used to be, people can be building on top of them. So people from the Amazons and the Googles can come in and just build the application layer on top of existing Web3 technologies. And at that point, any users that are using those apps don't even necessarily need to know that it's a Web3 app the same way that if you're using Netflix, you don't know it's built on AWS unless Netflix goes down and then everyone's like, oh, it's AWS's fault that I can't watch, I don't know, BoJack Horseman, like boo. But other than that, unless something fails, you shouldn't need to know about the underlying technology. And I think if we can get to that point, it'll be really exciting. It's a great segue into, so blockchain's obviously always been extremely hot for innovation. It just seems to be like part of the ethos, right? How do you think that that compares to innovation in Web2, right? First, I would say. And then second, how do you think we can encourage or why should some of these enterprises even bother exploring at this point if it is kind of unclear in the US on like a regulatory landscape? Steph, Steph, do you want to uh, yeah, kick that one off? Okay, so I think the, the question was, how, how do we explore? So first, how does innovation in Web3 compare to innovation okay. in Web3? And then why should Web2 be interested in innovating with Web3 tech stack? Yeah, okay. So um, I think when I think of innovation in Web2, I think a lot of it happened 10 to 20 years ago. Um, and I imagine that as kind of literally the Silicon Valley show. That's what I imagine uh, innovation in Web 2 um, being like where the Ubers are developed, uh, where things at Google are interesting and all of that. I missed the boat on that wave of innovation. And so I kind of see Web 3 as my chance to get in on that next wave. That's part of why I think it's so exciting that the space is still relatively small and it hasn't been fully adopted. You have so much room to innovate and build something that hasn't been done before or even improve on something that was done in Web 2, but you could do it in a more transparent way in Web 3. That said, I don't think that the killer Web 3 app uh, or use case has been invented yet. I mean, like obviously DeFi is huge for cutting out the middleman, which is banks um, in transfers. But beyond that, um, we still haven't seen kind of like the killer use case. And AI is different in that chat GPT, my mom is literally using, she was excited about it and talked to me about it on Mother's Day. And she's like, did you know I used chat GPT to write a poem about Lexi, which is my parents' 10 year old dog. She's like, I had it write four stanzas, they rhymed, I added details. Like chat GPT immediately gave her and my dad, a ton of utility and enjoyment in a way that they just don't get excited about, like sending something um, 
on a blockchain. And they know how to do that now too, but it doesn't enhance their daily life the way that chat GPT does. So I think once we get to the point that that's happening, um, and it's not just like sending crypto because like, who wants to have a Venmo that's web three version where you have a taxable event every time you split the bill? I don't. So there's gotta be some other thing that's coming that anyone could build um, that's the killer use case. So that's what I'm excited about. And I think getting in right now is great because you develop that context around what's already there and the tools that have already been built. So you'll see those gaps where you're like, oh, why don't we have, I don't know, a caching layer for uh, soulbound NFTs? Like that hasn't been done, but soulbound NFTs don't get transferred. So you shouldn't have to continuously like query for them. Just easy solutions like that haven't been built and could be your first startup in the Web3 space. So uh, uh, that was amazing. That was amazing stuff. I have uh, sort of a uh, self-driving car analogy that I think I want to share here. So Steph, you mentioned that um, you know Web2 is kind of the, the Ubers and the Silicon Valley startups and things like that. And if I were to compare that to like a self-driving car, um, self-driving cars have actually been around for a, a couple of years, right? Um, you've got Cruise, you've got um, Waymo, you've got all these different companies. Um, so if we think of this self-driving car driving around, um, that's kind of web two in that it's owned by a company and the, it may or may not make money or uh, not make a profit. Maybe there's so much spent on research, whatever. Um, but web three would come around and say, okay, now that car is not going to be owned by a company, but rather um, the company, um, rather the car is going to be owned by a DAO or it's going to be uh, its own independent contract. And the car can drive around autonomously and it can recharge itself and it can pay for uh, you know, it's electricity at meters, um, you know, by using funds that it earned from giving people rides. Um, and suddenly this car is like its own autonomous thing that's going around and maybe it's governed by somebody, um, but it's not the case that it's owned by like a for-profit company or or something that's that's more like Web2. So I think that's kind of interesting. I think it's, it's uh, extremely empowering when uh, people can start a company and then suddenly have backers for it that are not traditional backers, meaning uh, maybe people purchase the NFT collection, uh, maybe they mint something, maybe they uh, use a, a utility token. Um, but there are there are other ways for these, um, you know, Web three startups to to get funding and to to get the snowball rolling, um, versus in Web two where they go the down the traditional path of okay, um, family and friends, um, accelerator. Then let's raise a Series A. I I think this is more uh, uh, democratic and more and more open, a uh, meritocratic, open to people um, who maybe uh, uh, maybe wouldn't pursue the path of entrepreneurship, but say, okay, here's a here's an avenue that I could take. And just adding on to what Kevin said with the self driving car example, that company wasn't a Web three native company, right? They were building self driving cars already. So adding just one element of Web three could really enhance. Um, the user experience because now they don't the user doesn't have to worry about payments and things they're just auto earning and then auto spending um, based on that and it just kind of simplifies things so they don't have to think about that and that's just one more perk for your user which is awesome this is already an awesome conversation guys like so so cool right so I think another great segue, where do hackathons fit into all of this? So I think um, my my opinion, or I guess where I started going to hackathons is, um, you know, on the weekends, right? Um, I had a, you know, a, a full-time job and the weekends were, were for hackathons, right? I think giving people an, an avenue to experiment and explore and break out of the normal routine uh, is is extremely important. Because otherwise you might, you know, kind of have the blinders on and kind of only be focused on your lane and you might not see um, this, this new opportunity of, of Web3 development, right? If you're not already in Web3. Um, pressure makes diamonds as well. Um, I work best like under stress and under pressure. Um, maybe not everybody does, but if I have like a specific urgency, right? If I have a hackathon deadline that says, I have 36 hours, I need to turn this in Sunday morning at 12 a.m. or 12 noon, um, you know, otherwise it's no good. Um, you're going to build something, right? And uh, the the teamwork is another really cool thing. Um, people bring in, you know, different skill sets, right? 
Somebody could be a, a designer, somebody could be back end, front end, somebody could be, you know, scrum master, all these different sorts of, of roles that can come together. And uh, teams that do really well might even go on to build something that ends up, uh, you know, in, in production or uh, something that they can actually, you know, start a real uh, company with. Yeah, completely everything Kevin said. I think the number one thing that we see out of hackathons is people learn a ton. They use things that they don't use in their day job. So that's a great time to join a hackathon because you'll also have access to people at the company uh, that you're, whose tech you're using to ask questions directly and get feedback. So that's the first really good reason. The second is hackathons are a good time to build an MVP. It doesn't really have to be that good but you can build something that has kind of like one flow that goes all the way through and use that to ask people like, is this something that's actually needed in the space? Would you use this? Would you buy it? What does it need? And people are like a lot more willing to give something that's not the best feedback uh, in a hackathon setting because they realize, oh, they built this in three days. It's just a prototype. We can ignore some of like the weird UX things and just give feedback on the idea. And then you can use that to build something better. Um, usually your hackathon project isn't the idea that you send to production, but you can riff on it or get more feedback and build something based on that. Uh, and that's really valuable. And the time boxing of it is great because you won't have something that's perfect and you'll know going in, like I'm not striving for perfection. I'm just getting something done, putting it out there, getting feedback and then building the next thing or maybe just completely scrapping it but moving on with um, a ton of experience with a new technology. And that's always valuable too. So really there's no downside to doing the hackathon. Always good things. It, it's I, Web3 and the hackathons are very kind of integrated to the fabric of the community, right? And it, it's a great opportunity to meet people and to kind of expand your network and get to meet people that are you know, from all walks of life and all different skill sets and all different kind of areas, right? Build out a great team. Um, how do you think that that kind of compares to, let's say, and let's talk virtual for a second, to like a Web3 virtual hackathon versus a Web2 virtual hackathon, if you guys have ever like seen them or participated. Um, how do you think they compare or differ? Or like, why should somebody that's, let's call it a uh, JavaScript dev, right? that knows that they're really good at JavaScript, why should they think about joining a, a Moonbeam or a Polygon hackathon that's going on, whether it's an on-site or virtual? Um, like, where do you start, right? The uh, the first thing that I just say to the JavaScript developer is like, welcome. Um, your skill set is very valuable here, right? You can still use tons of JavaScript uh, in your DAP. Um, and, you know, maybe you pick up some Solidity, maybe you find a Solidity dev. Um, but I would say, uh, you know, part of, part of the allure, I think is that this is new and this is still like cutting edge. Whereas, um, you know, if you've been building, uh, in a, in a web two hackathon, you know, maybe you're building on tech that's, you know, five, 10, 20 years old, maybe a company needs to update its products or service offerings and things like that. And it doesn't maybe seem quite as exciting as building something that's drastically new on this completely new infrastructure. Yeah, totally agree. Um, most of Web3 hacking is Web2 tech, honestly. Like the whole front end is Web2 and JavaScript. Um, you'll be, if you're working on the front end of the DAP, you'll be calling the DAP using like libraries and APIs the same way you would for any other API. So don't let that deter you. Um, for the smart contract stuff, just start with whatever docs uh, that of like some protocol that's sponsoring the hackathon because the other reason that web3 hackathons tend to be a little cooler in my opinion than web2 is money there's way more money and prizes in web3 than web2 hackathons at least that i've seen um and if there's about 200 projects submitting to a web3 hackathon you really do have a pretty good chance of winning something and most of the web3 hackathons it's not just like first prize second prize and third prize it's like first to fifth, but for each different technology. So if you use something new, which you're incentivized to do, you really do have a good shot at winning, especially if you talk to that company ahead of time and say like, this is what I built. I'd love to get your feedback. 
Um, so it's a good chance for you to learn a technology, network with the company, and then potentially uh, get a job afterwards if you vibe really well with the project. So there's there's really only upside to doing Web3 hackathons, in my opinion. Awesome. It, it, you you hit on something that's so, so valuable. Like, but, but again, I'm not a developer. I'm not going to pretend to be. But I, I do know that most people probably don't know that 60% of the project is going to be on a tech stack that they already understand. And it really just gives them the opportunity to like build something really cool. Think about focusing on like cool new stuff and, and whatever you can think up out of the box, right? Because it is so new. Um, this is answering a lot of my questions that were already on here as we're going. It's awesome. So let me, let me see if I can find something real quick. <laughs> so what do you think? Well, here, here's something just side note. Um, it's not always apparent to web two devs, how much support it's available eh? and how much funding is available for their project at really any stage in web three versus web two. But um, let's talk about the difference between grants between the two for a second, right? Can one or both of you talk a little bit about how each organization, say Moonbeam and Polygon, offer support, programs, learning, kind of all of those different things that are re readily available on Web3 at this point? Sure, Steph, you want to take that first? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with uh, the, the freest thing, which is learning. Um, there's a lot of Web2 coding boot camps, and they're kind of expensive, in my opinion. The Web3 educational resources that exist are largely free, public goods, open source. So you can learn completely for free. There's a lot of good ones. Uh, a couple that come to mind are Alchemy University, completely free, where you can learn JavaScript and Solidity. Um, I, I believe there's like some loose cohorts, but it's mostly learn as you go. And then you kind of post in the Discord so you get to learn with the community. And Code Club is another one that does completely free education. Uh, and it's typically sponsored by a protocol, like Polygon Labs has sponsored one. Um, I don't know if you have as well, Kevin, uh, but that's a great way to learn Web3 for free. So those are some free resources. And then when it comes to grants, lots of different protocols also give grants and some do retroactive funding. So grants are given upfront. Um, so you have to write a grant proposal of kind of like what you need and what you need to use the money for. And then a retroactive grant is if you've already built something and it's been adopted, you can apply for a retroactive grant to get money for the thing that you've already built that's super successful. Um, the next thing you can do is an accelerator. So if you have a project and you kind of want to eventually turn it into a startup, accelerators can be really helpful to guide you through that process um, and also pair you with like really great mentors and advisors as you start to raise. And then beyond that, I think accelerators help you there too. Uh, so those are kind of some of the things that I know about that help builders. Kevin, do you have some others? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, you mentioned uh, like academies and learning resources. And um, we do have a uh, Moon Builders Academy, um, which is kind of like a um, you know self-paced course. Um, but yeah, YouTube is a big one. Um, I like YouTube because they're a little bit more current, right? You can kind of be on the on the cutting edge and, and finding like the latest um, things on on YouTube tutorials. Um, and in terms of grants, of course, uh, yeah, Web3 is the only industry that I know of where you can have a uh, essentially a for-profit company, uh, and then you can also be awarded grants. No strings attached. That's a huge deal. Uh, I've heard of in academia, of course, lots of grants. If you want to do a study, you can get a grant, um, but they're not generally right yet, you know, a company that's trying to grow. Um, if a company's trying to grow, right, you have to go get venture capital. Uh, but here in Web3, you can do both. Uh, there's no exclusion that says that we're not going to give you a grant uh, if you are looking to raise money as well, and, and typically vice versa, right? So no strings attached grants, um, but the grants come with more than just money. Um, part of it is uh, technical help. Part of it is uh, mentorship and advising, um, connecting with other people who could help you, possibly VCs. Um, and then there's also uh, ecosystem marketing support. So uh, when we work with a, a a team and that gets a grant, 
um, we kind of have like a complete package of things that we like to work with them and, and offer them. And that includes marketing support, um, doing a um, community uh, event, whether that's like a technical event or an event that's targeted towards um, everybody in the community, tweets, all that sort of thing. Um, and the intangible parts that I think are really valuable are the connections. So you may not even need money. You may just want like a token amount of funds um, in order to get a grant. Um, but then you might say like, what we're really looking for is we want connections to so-and-so or could you help us, right? And there is part of like a vetting, right? And there's part of a uh, due diligence process and stuff before somebody gets a grant. So by getting this grant, you are essentially saying that you are worthy, right, of of these connections and getting this help and you're worth the time, you know, of the of the team. A little different from a grant in Web two, right? It's almost it's the same word, but it means something totally different at this point. Almost milestone based, but that's about the only similarity. It seems like. Um, so that's a uh, well. I'll, I'll also do this shamelessly. We'll plug Anthony and the Encode team who are doing awesome work. Um, candidly, think we're way overdue on a partnership there. So stay tuned in the future. Um, beyond that, great time to talk about projects, right? So a lot of the people that are in the audience, I am sure, have existing projects that they've either worked on hackathons or continuously building on that are right now on Web2 Rails, right? Why even explore? If you're somebody that's curious already, okay, but like, why should somebody who maybe not even know about this yet explore their project on, on some form of blockchain? component or Web3 component? So part of it might be just to uh, expand your given users, right? Um, you're going to have uh, a lot of people who are, what, I, what I've witnessed, you have uh, a lot of people who want to be, you know, onto the next big thing. And by kind of relaunching or, or launching again, you know, your, your application, I think you have the chance to drive a lot of users, um, gain some publicity um, and some notoriety and, uh, you know, bring uh, additional people um, to your app. Yeah. And there also could be like a potential really good use case, depending on what you're building. I know I've been really interested in, um, trusted location recently, uh, where you can kind of like prove the location that you were in either for like civil resistance reasons or, um, just like more trust, which is easier to do on a blockchain than in any other kind of sense. Um, also, I don't know if you all know about kind of like social apps on chain. Uh, there's Twitter alternatives like Lens Protocol. And one of the benefits of that is that you own all of your content and also your handle. I don't know if you were following, but Twitter was renamed to X, I believe. And it was a little controversial, but Elon took um, the X handle away from the user who had that before. And he, I think his uh, bio was like X, like the variable. So I bet it was a developer, um, but X was given back to the parent company, previously Twitter. And that was controversial because uh, there was this like lack of idea of ownership of the profile. So if you're building something where you want your users to own some piece of the data in the app, blockchain could be a really good solution um, or like data storing mechanism. So depending on your use case, blockchain could be really important for it. what I say? I, I said I was going to do it at some point, right? So if you have a project, what's even holding it back at this point? Funding is fairly, fairly easy to come by, right? If your project's worthy, uh, there's tons of support. And what more can you really ask for? candidly. Now, let's shift gears for a second and talk enterprise, right? If you're a large, let's say, mid-sized to true enterprise size business that's that's interested in blockchain, you keep hearing it over and over and over again, and I'll, I'll use the buzzwords like everybody else, it's still not a mature industry, right? You can go on Rect right now and see everybody who's can just, you know, getting hacked day after day after day after day. Um, the regulatory environment in the U.S. is unclear at best, right? So why should, and let's assume that these enterprises are probably building in a closed system rather than, than open source, but why should somebody at an enterprise level think about Web3 as their tech stack? Why should they explore or even host hackathons, for example? That's a fantastic question. Um, 
And part of it, I think, has to do with, uh, you know, modernizing their infrastructure, right? Um, if you're, uh, you know, a big enterprise, you've been around for a very long time, uh, you're probably paying people a lot of money to maintain these old systems um, and kind of patching them here and there and kind of making sure that they that they work just right. Um, but instead, you could maybe uh, evolve your infrastructure and perhaps use a blockchain. It could be um, perhaps one that uh, there, are, there are many options, right? So when we typically talk about public blockchains and, and open and public blockchains, um, but there are avenues for you to have your own, uh, you know, quote unquote, either internal blockchain or semi-private or things like that. Um, I hear about Polygon's supernets and other options for app chains. There's app chains within Polkadot that you can launch that you may say, hey, look, you know, not everybody can be a validator on this chain, but only, you know, the company can be a validator. And, um, you know, we're only going to share a specific amount of information with the outside world. We might share no information with the outside world. Um, and that, believe it or not, that that gives a lot of comfort to executives. Um, executives in cybersecurity and IT uh, get extremely concerned uh, about any sort of data that's that they don't have control of um, that's, that's going to live out there uh, forever. So if you can say, hey, we can give you something that's an internal blockchain or a semi-private or something that's only going to live within your enterprise and your trusted entities, um, that's something that, that is attractive. And the cool thing is that they don't have to do it on their own anymore. Um, AWS has options for spooling up uh, blockchains. Um, and there are other options, you know, within Polkadot um, where you don't have to do it alone, right? You have help to help you uh, create it. Yeah, completely. Both AWS and GCP have options for this. Um, and I, I think we see more and more big companies getting in kind of through NFTs. Um, and then all of the gaming companies are also thinking about NFTs and uh, like Especially, especially with the recent EIP, I think it's six five five one that has that has like nested NFTs. So you could basically build a universe like Farmville, where NFTs own NFTs. So you could have like an NFT that's a farm, um, and within that you could have farmers and blueberries and all kinds of things. So I think there's going to be lots of cool things in gaming, so that people can own different pieces of their game characters and take them to other universes. Uh, to me, that sounds like a Nickelodeon crossover episode of like Jimmy Neutron and Timmy Turner, but I love it. It's fun. Um, and then also lots of luxury goods and brands are getting into Web3 again through NFTs. So I think NFTs, like I said, for me was the gateway, but also for big brands is the gateway to kind of um, create a community uh, around their customers and give their customers kind of pieces of the brand uh, so that they kind of have more ownership. And I think that's a cool thing that hasn't really been done before. Um, and people are really into it. So it's fun to see that bringing Web3 in is connecting customers to brands in ways that they didn't feel as connected before. NFTs are the gateway, right? How ironic. But a follow-up question for both of you. So can you tell us, and this is, we might have to dig, but what is your favorite real world blockchain use case that's creating impact today? You can think of, it's like spotlight, but can you think of something offhand that you'd like to reference? So uh, there's a new for, one that just oh, launched. Go for oh, it. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Sam. No, no, no. Go. You go first. Um, the one I was going to say is that this is a, a brand new one that just launched on uh, Moonbeam, which is called Teddy Dow. Um, it's an NFT collection, uh, which is kind of like a perpetual NFT collection. Each day there's a new one minted um, and all the proceeds go to charity and the winner of the auction gets to choose um, which charity they'd like to uh, to donate the the funds to. So they're happy because they get a very cool NFT. And then, of course, you know, everybody else is happy because the charity is receiving the funds. That's awesome. I love public goods. Uh in Web3. I was going to say that my favorite use case or the one that I see as most useful right now is remittances, which is when you can send money kind of across borders. A lot of people in the US do this to send money uh, to family members in other countries. And the reason it's very cool to do this on a blockchain is that there's kind of no limitation of like, oh, it, you have to wait three to five business days when the bank is open, or there's a $25 wire transfer or you can't send money to this country. 
And so they're able to send value on a blockchain immediately. And then their relative in another country can use that to pay for things that they need. So I think that's really cool and unblocks people and helps them spend money in other places. Awesome. I know we have covered a lot of ground to say the least, but what are some emerging tech that that excites you in the space? You, you, Steph, you brought up Eigenlayer, right? So Eigenlayer is a great, great example, tons of momentum, awesome project. What's some other type of cool tech that you're super excited about? And who wants to go first? I can jump in. Um, I love talking about uh, app chains. And uh, this is a something that uh, Tansy is building within uh, Polkadot, making it easier for you to launch your own Polkadot blockchain. Um, and I, I think that app chains are such a big deal because uh, as an application grows, right, um, it has increasing needs for, for block space, um, but it also has increasing needs for governance. And kind of the ultimate end goal, I believe, for an app that gets big enough is that you kind of want to be self-sovereign, right? You want to make decisions um, and kind of isolate those decisions, I guess, to your to your token holders of the uh, of the DAP, if the DAP has a token. Um, but essentially, you become kind of a sovereign uh, with your app chain. And so you are deciding, you know, all of your upgrade decisions and your validator decisions, and you, you have um, kind of the ultimate security assured to you because you're um, your your own sovereign chain. And the uh, limitations to date, I think, have been kind of the complexity in getting that going. Um, it's a ton of work to spool up your own um, blockchain, right? But there are uh, uh, solutions out there to, to kind of make that easier. And that's the first part of the puzzle. And the second part of the puzzle is, okay, once you have your own app chain, how do you talk to other chains? You need to be able to bridge funds and talk and do cross-chain contract calls um, with the other chains that are out there. A lot of stuff still yeah. to be. Oh, what was that? But a lot of stuff still to be built, right? All the more reasons to to have more hackathons, right? But Steph, what about you? Yeah, app chains are awesome. Um, I think the thing I'm most excited about is zk, which is zero knowledge, uh, like kind of a deep cryptography concept. Um, but zk lets you prove things without having any of like the underlying data exposed. So this is being used right now kind of for scaling purposes. Polygon has a Polygon ZK EVM chain um, where ZK is used to scale Ethereum. So instead of having all of the data posted on Ethereum, it can be posted on Polygon ZK EVM. And then the only thing posted on Ethereum is a ZK proof of um, like a batch of transactions. And so you only post one transaction on Ethereum, which makes kind of every transaction cheaper and faster because it's technically off the main chain. So super excited about that and also excited about ZK for privacy. Um, on Polygon ZK EVM, we're using it for scaling purposes, but you could also use ZK to keep information completely private so that you could do interesting things secretly on the blockchain. I think Kevin referenced earlier that big companies don't want to have all of their data exposed and neither do users. Like when I use Venmo with my friends, half the time I mark the little box that says keep this transaction private because I don't need all of my friends and family seeing what I'm secretly buying. <laughs> uh, maybe if I'm buying a pizza, it's fine. And I'm like, keep that one public, but anything else is more personal. And so on the blockchain right now, everything's public, but potentially adding ZK solutions, you could make private transactions um, and it's useful for both private data and things where you don't want to associate your address with a transaction. So very excited about that because I think it'll lead to more adoption by everybody who is skeptical about kind of the permanence of putting something on chain. Super excited about ZK. Overdue on a ZK hackathon, candidly. Um, so many different use cases. Hacker Earth is, is exploring, which I won't give away too much there. But beyond that, so we've seen a lot of regulatory challenges, obviously globally with, with blockchain and Web3 in general. All three of us sit here in the States, right? So what do you think, and, and we are probably not the best people to ask this and nor is this advice or anything else with all the disclaimers that go in front of it, but 
what do you think will help get this across the last mile here in the States? And, and should the U.S. care about getting clarity on regulation to get better innovation and adoption here locally? Definitely. Um, actually, I think Brian Armstrong tweeted something today. He is the CEO of Coinbase. And Coinbase does really incredible things uh, for regulation. They advocate for the whole Web3 community to the U.S. government and other governments. Um, but he posted something today, and it was basically like, use this in three clicks to send an email to your local representative um, about a vote that's going to happen pretty soon. And I did it. It took me less than two minutes, sent an email to my local representative saying like, vote yes on this uh, crypto specific bill. So I'm really grateful to him and also to Rebecca Reddick from Polygon Labs and everyone who's doing kind of all the, the hard legal work to kind of get um, politicians to understand the positive use cases of blockchain and Web3 and how it's not just for uh, secretly embezzling money. And I'm the wrong person to give any financial advice, so I won't do that. But I will say like, stay up to date on all of the crypto legal stuff by following the, the lawyers who are at the front lines, including Re Rebecca and Brian. Over to Kevin. <laughs> Oh, I, lo I love that you mentioned that, uh, Steph, about um, talking to your representative. And uh, it it's so easy for us to get caught up in like voting in our DAOs and voting on our chains. And we're kind of in our own little world that we forget that that there are real world, uh, you know, ways that we can have influence, I guess, outside of the blockchain, right? You can write your um, write to your representatives. And uh, and I'm certainly looking up to, to Brian and, um, you know, the other um, people who are who are influencing this and moving it forward, and uh, they're uh, extremely uh, uh, brave and taking on a position of of leadership, which I which I admire greatly. Um, in terms of uh, so the the original question, were we thinking about uh, kind of um, like hurdles or uh, just oh the the le the regulatory landscape? Okay, so it's not a question of right is uh, blockchain innovation going to continue to come. Um, it's going to, blockchains are going to continue to innovate, adapts are going to continue to innovate. Uh, they're all uh, amazing things uh, are, are going to come and I'm extremely excited about it. Um, but the question then is, you know, is this going to live, uh, you know, is this innovation and rewards and, uh, you know, therefore um, uh, benefit, right? Is this going to benefit uh, the uh, local economies or is this something that has to take place, you know, outside? Uh, of the United States. And uh, there is a, a huge opportunity for the US to benefit by introducing uh, clarity and uh, you know providing uh, safe spaces and uh, other avenues for, for exploration and experimentation. And just to go back to the self-driving car, right? Um, I live in San Francisco and I, I see self-driving cars every single night, dozens of them all the time. It's, it's incredible. And it makes me feel like I'm living in some sort of sci-fi movie or something. Um, so San Francisco said yes, right, to allow these self-driving cars. If Cruise goes to a city and they say, nope, you can't do your business here in this city, then Cruise is going to say, they're going to ask other cities and they're going to go to Seattle and then they're going to go to Denver and they're going to figure out another place where they can test. Um, and so the city that says yes, they're going to get a ton of jobs because somebody needs to go and maintain all those cars. They need to fix them. They need to troubleshoot them when they get stuck in the middle of the road. And uh, it's a matter of saying yes to, to innovation, right, and saying that uh, uh, yeah, that's all. That's all. Love it. Love it. Love it. So here is a one part question and then we'll go into our final one. We'll, we'll skip the Q and a today and we'll just go bell to bell if that's cool with all of you. Um, so looking ahead, five minutes seems like a, uh, you know, a long time in, in web three. What do you think is going to happen over the next, let's call it five years? Do you think we'll cover these these hurdles and we'll see the next hundred million users onboarded? Or like, where, where do you think we're headed? And I'll just leave it open-ended. Steph, how about you? Yeah, um, I'm hoping there's more apps continuously developed. And then I think what Kevin was referencing earlier with like chains being uh, kind of connected through bridges, um, will connect every chain so that there's less kind of visible competition of like, oh, I'm building on this chain or that chain. 
and more just kind of like things in different places that are connected no matter what. Um, so I think we'll see more app chains and specific chains used for specific use cases, whether it's like the DeFi chain, the NFT chain, um, whatever it is. And I kind of see it also like the railroads used to be where everybody's competing to give the users the best experience, which is great for the whole space because we get faster and cheaper for everyone to use. Um, I also think that innovations like things built on top of account abstraction will be really important because again, it's a huge user experience benefit um, when you're not thinking about your seed phrase constantly or you're not having to, I don't know, sign a bunch of transactions and you get them bundled into one. Just small things that we don't think about in Web 2 that we have to think about in Web 3 once those are abstracted away. It gives the users a better experience and makes them excited to use an app and not be like, oh, God, I have to connect to my MetaMask. I have to transfer tokens in. They're on the wrong chain. I have to bridge them over. Like the steps to do anything that should be easy uh, may, are way too time consuming right now. So I think if we can get more user experience people, more designers, um, and more people from different industries into Web3, we'll have that cross multi multidisciplinary mindshare that we need to create things that actually work and are delightful for our users. So that's what I'm looking forward to in the next like three to five years. Absolutely. Everything what Steph said, um, especially when you're mentioning um, cross-chain connections and you know improving the user experience. Um, Moonbeam's goal is to kind of uh, help and enable that as, as much as possible because you know we believe that there are going to continue to be a proliferation of, of chains and uh, additional app chains and things like that. And we need to provide meaningful improvements you know to the end user experience so that new people can come in and they're not intimidated by bridging or you know that the need for that is is hopefully um removed um and then uh in terms of you know what uh, what we're looking forward to and in, in the future and adoption right people who work in this space every day right you may a couple a year or two could go by right and you're like gee you know i thought that i thought that we might have more progress or more users or more radical change happen within those two years. Um, but that's maybe, you know, maybe we didn't see that. Um, but if you were to take a, a step away from crypto for five years or 10 years, which you shouldn't, and nobody should, we want people to stay involved, right? If they were to come back in 10 years, they're going to say, oh my God, this is incredible. Like, look at all that we've achieved. Look at how many users are using uh, this this chain. And, and of course, as many people say, like, Hopefully in 10 years, almost everybody will be using blockchain. They may not care about it. They may not care about which particular chain and which endpoint and which RPC URL they're using. Hopefully um, they don't have to care about any of that, but um, they'll be using it and benefiting from it. Um, at least that's, you know, that's the goal. Do you, do you both feel that we, that Web3 will have truly taken off when you can't tell that it's there? Pretty much, right? And here's just a kind of side question for both of you. Do you think that the Web3 user journey or like the native Web3 user, right, is is who we should be mapping the user experience around? Probably not the native Web3 user, probably towards the uh, Web3 non-user, right? Um, in order to make it friendly and and welcoming, and of course you can always have an advanced mode, right? There's nothing wrong with having, you know, uh, like a degen mode or some settings that you can get super advanced with. I think that's perfectly fine, um, but I think you want the default to be something that's that's welcoming, because if it's not, somebody's going to take one look at it and say, you know what, I'm going to go back to the old ways of doing things. I'm this is this is too much for me. Step two and add. No, completely agree. Um, I think sometimes we get caught in these like conversations about like centralization versus decentralization, uh, self custody versus um, giving somebody else custody. And I think there's room for both and there's room for solutions in the middle. And those are the friendliest to people who are new anyway. So I don't think that we should be like full decentralization maxis and self custody maxis because Realistically, that's not what everyone wants and needs. Um, and we should protect people. Like we don't want somebody to lose their full net worth because they made one mistake on the blockchain. 
that wouldn't happen in web two, but it could go wrong in web three. And that gives someone a terrible user experience. And we should protect that first. And then kind of like, obviously have abilities to take guardrails off for people who are more experienced as well. But giving optionality is important. Awesome. This has been a great chat, guys. This has been a lot of fun. We need to do it again sometime soon. Um, quick question for both of you, and we'll leave it at this. What, what advice would you have to somebody who is in the community, curious, and thinking about exploring? So one uh, bit of advice that I've seen personally, uh, you know, play out um, is that you can kind of create the job that you want or that you might strive towards. Uh, there's so many ways to get involved in Web3, right? You could be a Discord helper. You could just answer people's questions. You could build something. You can uh, do all these things. And if somebody's active enough in a in a community or they're answering questions and they're helping out, you know, somebody's eventually going to say, look, this person's already doing this job. Like we should just hire them, you know, and they should go in and be our technical support engineer or something like that. Um, that's, that's something that I've noticed. And then, you know, if you have the, uh, the, the freedom, uh, and the ability to, you know, take a, take a risk and, and dive in, right. You're going to be admired and respected, and you're also going to get the advantage of, um, you know, being in, uh, earlier, right. So, uh, once, uh, everything goes viral again in a, in a couple of years, right? And people are maybe talking more about blockchain. Um, you will have already been building for, for years in advance and um, you'll be able to recognize the opportunity and see um, and take advantage of it. Yeah, completely. I My advice is just do a hackathon because they're fun. You'll learn something. Um, and who knows, you might get a job, you might start a startup or you might say, this isn't for me. And then you've only spent three days and you've learned something that you can take into like superconductors or AI or whatever, whatever you're looking at next. So yeah, do a hackathon. Do a hackathon. That is very sound advice. And I think a perfect. 100% note. agree. So guys, it's been an absolute pleasure having you both here. It, awesome conversation. We'll have it. Well, it's being streamed on YouTube. So the recording will be up here momentarily. And, and again, thank you both for your time. Have an awesome rest of your week. And uh, if you have any questions about getting involved in either Polygon or in Moonbeam, please do not hesitate to reach out, join the Discord, join the Telegram. You can find both Kevin and Steph on there, I'm sure, extremely easily, actually. And um, yeah, join a hackathon. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Steph. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody.